first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the, the Diacon Committee, including my good friend, Dr. Banshi Sabu, for the kind invite uh, among the other members as well. Now, what I'm going to be talking today is slightly a different um, feel to what we normally talk on this um, on, on these conferences. But I think this is a very important issue. And in my various roles, I have started realizing that if we actually look at the population in whom the research is done in diabetes is, ex is very different from the population that we are treating. Now in my talk today, I'm going to take through you through what the issues are, show you a good case and a not so good case, and then make uh, some recommendations. So this is a very interesting, what you can call a heat map about the world total population. As we know that the bulk of the human population either resides in the Indian subcontinent or in, the, or, or in China. That's where nearly half or more than half of the global population is. Now, if you look at the prevalence of people with diabetes, and again, as we know, diabetes is turning out to be more of a kind of an Asian pandemic starting from Horn of Africa to the, to the, to the, to the, to the Southeast Asia. That is where most people with diabetes live. And if you look at the prevalence rates in the UK currently, we're talking about 5%, while in countries like India, we are really getting nearly to the 20% to, to the, to the mark, mark. And with these big populations, we need a better understanding of diabetes. Now, if you look at the world by the cohort of publications on diabetes that comes in, what you find is that the most of the research in terms of large landmark clinical trials that really shape our practice, shape our guidelines, the reasons why we do, either you do the ADASD guidelines or the cardiovascular outcome trials, most of these publications have either come from North America or, or Europe. So this is, and this is something which is a very important issue for us to acknowledge and see how we can how we can tackle tackle them now this is a review paper that we did um, uh, a few years ago uh, with my good friend professor kunti and what we basically looked at is 12 studies which were, which really shaped the adasd guidelines in terms of the cardiovascular outcomes with glucose lowering therapies and type 2 diabetes and what we found was if you look at the South Asian population, where most of these studies or medications will be used, they're underrepresented in, in, in trials compared to a global population. So these trials did not have a representative South Asian uh, populations. And then we actually concluded is that the clinicians should exercise caution when generalizing the results of trials to their own practice. Uh, and this is something um, something uh, very important. Now, let us focus on what we call health inequalities and what, what they are and see how we can deal with them. So health inequalities, I think this is probably the best definition I could find of the health inequalities. Are These are avoidable inequalities that are unfair or unjust. In the UK, we have got something called the Equal Act, Equality Act of 2010. And this basically tries to handle the issue around health inequalities in the NHS. And it uh, lists uh, about eight conditions in which people could be discriminated and efforts should be made uh, for them not to be. So this includes like race and ethnicity, religion, age, et cetera, et cetera. So why is research important? And I think this is something uh, very important. So this is a publication from NIHRCRN. And what it basically shows is research in a hospital setting. And this could also be true in a population setting. So in centers that do research or involved in research, the mortality rate 
is extremely low. So if you're high on research, the mortality is low. And in centers in which the research is low, the mortality is high. A very simple association showing the relationship between the research and quality of care. And this can not only be applied to the institutes, but can be applied to the populations as well. So in populations or in groups in which we do less research, we are going to get high mortality or, or poorer outcomes. And in communities in which more research is done, you're going to get lower mortality and better outcomes. So research is not an optional extra uh, uh, as a health practitioner, but it should be an integral part of the practice. So the NIHRCRN have come up with, with these things that, that research is, uh, is, 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 is very important. And NHS does a lot of research and, you know, um, it, 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 it cares for nearly a million uh, patients every 36 hours. But even in this situation where research is a part of a healthcare system, certain communities are underrepresented in all studies. And this includes ethnic minorities like Black and South Asians in the UK, uh, women and elderly. <clears throat> Now I'm going to start off by saying, so whenever you talk about doing research in ethnic minorities or in South Asian communities in the UK, one of the things that is mentioned is that these, these communities are not interested in taking part in research or they don't have the aptitude for research. Now, let me, let me, let me rest that myth uh, to a while. So this is one of the studies that we set it up about 20 years ago. Uh, this is the United Kingdom Asian Diabetes Study. And the principle was very simple. In Birmingham, we've got a big South Asian population and we wanted to see what is the effect of diabetes or improving diabetes care in this population. I'm not going to go into this, but this is some of the publications that came out. Still, it is one of the longest running cohort uh, of patients. And some of the early studies or findings that we have from this study showed a clear differentiation between a South Asian and white population in terms of their profiles, age of diagnosis, duration of diabetes, ethnic difference in HbA1c, which is maintained over a 20 year cohort, more deaths in South Asians uh, when compared to the, white, uh, to the white population and a much, much higher prevalence of diabetes. We have also been doing a lot of work on Ramadan and diabetes, which is quite again a specific area and something very difficult uh, to do in the UK setting. Uh, since then, a lot of studies have been done at a global level. Um, this is just to show you the hierarchy of evidence, as we all know. Now, sadly, the studies that are done in an ethnic minority population, and I'm going to use the example of Ramadan, Ramadan are, are actually a bit low quality studies. So this is an update uh, I presented at the uh, South Asian Health Foundation conference and we did a kind of a Medline search on Google Scholar and we found nearly 230 publications on Ramadan. This was in 2021 and 2022. But the problem was there was increased number of studies, which is good, but these were mainly observational studies of low quality with very small sample sizes. And most of them were guidelines and consensus statements made on these small sample size. There were no RCTs or good quality RCTs and there were very few mechanistic or lab-based studies. We've tried to address this uh, by doing more of what we call real-world uh, studies on uh, validated databases. This was one of our studies uh, uh, led by Maria, one of our research fellows and, and, and Krish. And this, uh, we actually look at the thin database, which is one of the largest valid databases of nearly 12 million people over a period of 10 years to find the rate of infections uh, in Ramadan. So one of the challenges, uh, as I'm going to be talking about later, is that if you're interested in doing studies in the population, you can develop a methodology 
that is not just based on funding but by on other means to 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 address uh, to address that now let me turn to an another issue and just to illustrate why is research important in all populations now one of the landmark studies that has been published uh, from the uk by two very good colleagues of ours Roy Taylor and Mike Clean has been direct studies. I've seen direct being talked about globally, uh, and I've seen, uh, I've attended a lot of conferences, virtual ones in India, where direct has been said that, that this is a study for remission of diabetes. And it's absolutely brilliant studies, which was done in a primary case setting in Scotland and Northern England. It had nearly 149 practices, looked at total diet replacement, and it had some amazing results. 50% of the population achieved diabetes remission. So depending upon the weight loss, uh, if you lost 15 uh, kilograms in weight, then 86% of patients with diabetes disappeared or went into remission. So excellent study. And there was been a lot of excitement, both in the UK and glo globally to translate the study. But this study had one issue, just one issue. And this was nearly 99.9% .9 of the population in this study was white European. And most of the population came from what you would call the higher social economic strata. So essentially this was what we call a white suburban study. Now, as a part of the direct study, it was, it was agreed nationally to, to translate it across the UK and UK launched something called NHS Diabetes Remission Program. We had a pilot in Birmingham and there have been pilots across. <clears throat> now the finding of these pilots has been published in Diabetes Care. And this basically looked at the incidence and characteristics of remission of type two diabetes in England. And what it showed is that nearly 2 million people with diabetes, the overall remission rates per thousand was 9.7, showing that it was only working in a very minuscule number of the population. But what was interesting is that if you actually go down and see that in people, the, the diabetes remission uh, uh, program is working, where white ethnic female, uh, and, and with lower socioeconomic deprivation. So what this study is showing is that when you translate direct into a population level, it works, but it only works in the population in which the original study was done. And this is an important concept we all got to understand when we translate studies. So direct works and it works brilliantly, but it works only in the population in which the original trial was done. Now let us look at a look at a very good example about the study that works in all population, but it has been done in all population. This is the diabetes prevention program. So diabetes prevention program works, but we had the Dashing study, which was done in a Chinese population, the Finnish diabetes prevention program, which was done in a Finnish population, the diabetes prevention program done in the American population, and the Indian diabetes prevention program done. In, 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 in India. But what these studies actually show is that the way the diabetes prevention program works is different in different populations. And therefore, when you translate this into clinical practice, the, then different parameters uh, should be used. So this is the diabetes prevention program and Finnish diabetes uh, prevention program. Uh, Finnish was mainly in white European, uh, DPP also was majorly in, in white Europeans. And what it showed was the lifestyle group actually works, works better than, or, than metformin in DPP. And the remission or, or, the, or, or the prevention of diabetes is, is, is close to about 50, 55, 58% uh, in, in, in the lifestyle program. But if you look at the Indian diabetes prevention program, it shows that it works, but it works only in about 40% of the population, which is less. But interestingly, in the group that was given metformin is as effective as lifestyle. 
as uh, if you look in BPP, metformin was much lower than the lifestyle. So what it shows, it, what it shows is in an Indian population with prediabetes, metformin is perhaps as good as, as, as lifestyle. There could be a variety of reasons for that. It could be a different burden of disease, probably less uh, beta cell, uh, more beta cell dysfunction than insulin resistance, less obesity, uh, and so on and so forth. So what I have illustrated here today is, if you have a, a clinical trial program in a population, you can, you can pick up the subtleties which are there in differences and then use in, 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 in clinical practice. So what are the challenges? What are the challenges of uh, achieving uh, a representative global population in clinical trials? The biggest of it is funding. Now, when it comes to funding, most of the major funders of, of, of clinical trials, the MRC, the Welcome, um, the, 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 the Institute of Health um, in, in the United States, and I see these usually fund studies uh, which, uh, which, um, which are good, but it doesn't really look into the representative population. The second is, if you look at the industry, most of the industry now is much more focused on, on, the, on the Western Hemisphere. But as the things are changing, the pharmaceutical industry is realizing, and especially uh, in, during the COVID times, in, especially with the vaccine programs, there was uh, uh, insistence by various governments that the study should be done in the, in the local populations. The second issue is study designs. When, 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 when academics are designing studies, they are more, they're more looking for the results rather than the representative population. So this is something we need more adapted studies, reviewers. If you look at reviewers, both in terms of publications as well as the, uh, as well as the funders, uh, they again look at the quality of the studies rather than the representative populations. Recruitment has been an issue, uh, and the reason for the recruitment being an issue, and there's been a lot of work that has been done by us and others, is that the, that the, that the methods that we've used for recruitment, especially in the Western countries, is more based on a white population rather than uh, an ethnic minority or a South Asian or a black population. But if we adapt our recruitment Parts, as we have shown with the UCANs and other studies, it is possible very much to recruit an ethnic, ethnic, ethnic uh, population. There are lots of issues around what we call the perceived barriers, uh, and these perceived barriers are, and this is probably true at a global level, that a lot of people um, in, 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 in India and other countries in the UK somehow don't understand the importance of research and somehow have this conception that research may probably harm and they're being used as guinea pigs. Uh, but this is something that we all have to do to try and, 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 and get rid of uh, barriers. So language is an issue because most of these clinical trials are done in English and they're translated in English. So it's much more easier to, to recruit a kind of an English speaking population. Uh, so the question now is that what we are talking about is not inclusion, but proportional representation. If type two diabetes, as in the UK and as in other countries, is six times more common in a South Asian population than a white population, then the South Asian population should be more representative in the study. And finally, we need good quality academic interest by academics globally to push uh, for a representative population diabetic things. So these are some of the recommendations uh, that 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 I have made, and this is for the UK, but could be used globally, is the first thing is that all clinical trials, uh, this includes the pharmaceutical major uh, outcome trials, should have ethnic coding. If you look at some of the studies that have been done with the globus lowering therapies in type 2 diabetes, the ethnic coding is not, is not very good. They use the word Asian, that includes right from Japanese, Chinese to to Malaya, to, to Indians, to Pakistanis, to, to Arabs. That is not right. We need a much more uh, better ethnic coding in, in, in research. 
The second important thing, and this is something that we're pushing in the UK, and uh, and I um, urge my Indian colleagues to uh, push it with the government of India as well, is that they should be a legal framework for representative population. The Japanese do this. That if the research study does not have a representative population for a for a for a therapy or for 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 a for a technology, then it is not licensed. Uh, this single change will force the pharmaceutical industry to have a more inclusive representative uh, population. And this is what we are trying to do in the UK. Uh, the other thing is when funders are giving it, the, 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 there should be a thing of doing what, we, what I call impact, impact assessment of research on the whole population should be a mandatory requisite. It cannot be on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on a group of population that it shows, but it should be in the whole representative population. We need a culturally competent language training for researchers, and this is true globally, where they can explain to their patients what is research, why is research done, and the importance of research. And finally, when it comes to funding, and this is more for the NHS, uh, there should be schemes to be based on equitable outcomes in all populations. And this is my final slide in what I call equality versus equity debate. So thank you very much.